All righty. Well, it's okay. There we go. In search of the optimized mag loop. Now, I had it bounce in like that because this is not the optimum mag loop because there is no such thing as an optimum mag loop. There are lots of different mag loops, but there's no one single optimum mag loop despite what you might read on some of the glossy advertisements that you might see in the magazine or here and there, there's no one single optimum mag loop. One loop fits all. There just is no such thing. Optimized doesn't mean optimum. Doesn't mean this will do everything you want it to do. It means getting the best out of whatever mag loop you've got. That's what optimized means. Or getting the most economical or getting the most better best performing magnetic loop, but not necessarily the one all that fits all that's the best under all circumstances, because there is no one single optimum mag loop, just as there's no one single optimum antenna. Okay. Here we see a bunch of mag magnetic loops or so-called magnetic loops. I don't like the name as you'll understand why here in this presentation, but uh, here are a bunch of what are called magnetic loops. Uh, starting at the top up there with the very well-known MFJ magnetic loop and uh, a bunch of uh, principally home-built magnetic loops here built out of a built out of a number of different things aluminum and copper tubing and coax and other things single and multi-turn loops and multi-band loops and crossed loops and convoluted loops square and octagonal and round and other things magnetic loops are very are uh, so-called are very uh, are very popular do-it-yourself build it antennas. We have even one over there on the left built from a hula hoop, and that's not an uncommon piece of a material to build a mag so-called magnetic loop from. But believe me, there are truly very few designs out there on the web that one could call optimized, and. And of those pictures that I showed you just a minute ago here, these pictures here, there really is only one loop here in this picture, maybe two that are optimized. Can you pick it out? Most of them here are not optimized. Only that one in the lower left comes closest. Okay, there are few optimized web designs. So if you go out on the web, you're not gonna find most designs are optimized. And there are, believe me, many very misleading ads. When you go out there and look, and even in the magazines, they'll say, here's the best magnetic loop you can buy. Don't believe them. There's a lot of misleading advertising about these so-called magnetic loops. And if you go looking in the books and out there on the web for information about them on how to get a one that really is a good performer, you're going to find very little sound principle on how to build an optimized magma loop, one that gives you optimum performance. Because let's consider this word optimizing in respect to an antenna. If you use the word optimize in respect to an antenna with most hams, this is the word that's going to come to mind. For most hams, they're going to think of the big red worm here, the big red, the big red monster here. SWR, because that's to me, to what most hams, the term optimized means when you think of an apt antenna. And of course, optimizing the SWR in an antenna is an important thing, but that's not the only thing we need to optimize in an antenna. Well, there are many things that you might want to optimize in an antenna to get it to give you the best performance. It's certainly one of the things. And for a Mac loop, it's hardly the only thing. But let's take a simple dipole, for example. It might be close to the only thing that you need to optimize in a simple dipole. You know, cut the dipole to the correct length using the classical formula, L equals frequency divided by 468, and you might have an optimized dipole. But that is not true for a magnetic loop, or as we call them, magnetic loops. I'm going to take exception to that name, magnetic loop, later on here. But 
A lot of people know it by that name. So if I use it here in this presentation, doesn't mean I'm approving of the name because I really do not approve of that name as you'll see later on here. But there are at least at least six, six, five or six or seven things that you need to optimize about this, this particular type of an antenna before you really have an optimized, what I would call a small transmitting loop. There, it's not just one thing that we need to optimize in this loop to really have one that is well optimized. And I'm going to, we're going to go into these, these things, relative conductor diameter, construction material, loop shape, self-resonance, matching method, tuning method. And then if you want to use it for receiving only, we need to optimize quite a number of factors. And these are the factors we look at. It isn't by any means just SWR. We, there are a number of factors that need to be optimized if you want a good performing, quote, magnetic loop. We're going to look at them one by one here tonight. So this presentation is not how do mag loops work. I'm not going to talk about how they work. I'm not going to give you the pros and cons of magnetic loops. They're good antennas. I think they're very effective antennas. They're remarkable, in fact, particularly since they're quite small and they perform extremely well compared to much bigger antennas sometimes, and sometimes outperform antennas much larger than their size. And I'm not going to give you any formulas for building them, although I think you'll find from this presentation, you might gain enough information to want to go out and start building one. My objective tonight here is to tell you how to optimize the magnetic loops, to talk about the factors that make them optimum uh, in, in their performance, to how to maximize their performance. That's what I want to do, because a lot of you, you may even own a magnetic loop. You may own a magnetic loop that is anything but optimized in its performance. OK, let's take a look at these factors one by one. Number one, and believe me, it actually is the number one factor. It is the one factor where most loop builders fail. And I include in this most of the commercial mag loop builders. They fail most often in this one factor alone. You can probably forget all the other factors. And if you get this one right, you're probably going to get closest to the optimized loop. Now, this factor number one is the most important relative size of the conductor how big the conductor is, is to me the most important of all of the factors in when you make or buy a magnetic loop. And if you look at a magnetic loop and the, the size of the conductor is not correct, don't buy it. Because the size of the conductor in a magnetic loop determines two things. How efficient the loop is going to make. What's efficiency? Yeah, how much of your power gets out from the loop. That's efficiency. It also determines how low a frequency the loop will operate on. Loops, despite what many people think, can't operate on all frequencies. You might think, oh, you just add a bigger capacitor and it'll work on any frequency. That is just not true. This is determined more by the size of the conductor than anything. So if you don't remember anything from this presentation, remember, the size of the conductor in a magnetic loop is the most important factor. And if you get anything right, get it right. The rest of them are less important. OK, let me prove that to you. Here's a little graph that I prepared. And it's the graph that describes almost any magnetic loop. Almost any magnetic loop will have the same kind of a graph as this one. Uh, this is, and by the way, this one is perfect, prepared from all of the well-known equations that apply to all magnetic loops. The, the equations are, are well published in the literature. It's a graph for a four foot square magnetic loop. Why did I make it square? Well, you'll see that later, but it doesn't matter whether it's square or whether it's round or whether it's octagonal or whether it's triangular or whatever shape it is, hexagonal. All magnetic loops have this same kind of a characteristic efficiency curve. 
the shape of the loop is relatively irrelevant, although I'm going to show you there is an optimized shape, I believe, for a magnetic loop. We'll get into that. It's one of the factors. I'm going to use a square loop because I believe square loops are the best shape for magnetic loops. I believe square is the optimized shape of the loop. We'll get that later. So we're going to use a four foot square loop. Why did I pick four feet? Not because It's not particularly important, but four foot, I happen to believe, is the sort of the, the middle the middle sized loop that most hams will probably focus on. Let's suppose we build a four foot square loop. It could be a four foot round loop and it would have the same kind of curves. So don't worry about the fact that it's square here. Just worry about the shape of these curves and what you're building it out of and how the diameter of the material, that's the focus here is the diameter of the material, not its size, not its shape, but the diameter of the material. Focus in on that because that's this factor. Let's suppose we build three identical four foot square loop out of three different size conductors and look at their efficiency. In other words, look at how much power we're going to lose on various bands by building them out of different size conductors. And here are the sizes of the conductors. We're going to build one out of number 10 wire. Now, number 10 wire is pretty husky wire. And let's build another one, another four foot square loop out of RG8 coax. You know, if you go to a lot of websites, you'll see, see builders building mag loops out of RG8 coax. Some sites say build it out of, out of even, even larger coax. And here's another third one is let's build a, a four foot square loop out of two inch pipe, maybe out of copper pipe, you might think. That's nice, really big husky material, two inch pipe. Let's build two, four, uh, three four foot square loops out of 10 inch wire, some RG8 coax and some two inch pipe. And look at the efficiency. Now I'm gonna set arbitrarily here, 50% efficiency as the sort of cutoff point. Why 50%? Well, simply because it's, it's arbitrary. There's no standard for how much efficiency you can tolerate in a magnetic loop or in any antenna for that matter. It's just one S point down because all, all antennas have losses. How much loss can you tolerate? Well, it's up to you how much you can tolerate, but let's consider 50% as a kind of an arbitrary cutoff point. So anything below in the orange area is below 50%. Anything above in the white area is better. 50% is one S point loss of signal at the receive end. So if your antenna is losing 50% of the power your transmitter is putting into it at the receive end, you're only getting you're only getting one S point less signal. That's pretty trivial, pretty pretty insignificant. So let's go with that. And that's that's not so important how much you'll tolerate. That's an arbitrary figure here. But notice here how important the diameter of the of the of the conductor is. That's the point we're making here. If you make a magnetic loop out of number 10 wire, it isn't any good below 15 meters. If you make it out of RG8 coax, it isn't any good below 20 meters. And if you make it out of two inch pipe, it isn't any good below 40 meters. Below that, it's, it's a waste of time. It isn't worth the powder and shot to blow it up. So get this in your thinking if you're making or buying a magnetic loop. If it's made out of number 10 wire, don't buy it. If it's made out of RG8 coax, it isn't any good below 20 meters. If it isn't made out of two inch pipe, it isn't any good under 40 meters. It's certainly not any good down to 80 meters. Look at it. It's worthless down to 80 meters if it's uh, made out of any of these materials. Even two inch pipe magnetic loop, four foot square magnetic loop, isn't worth the powder and shot to blow it up down at 80 meters. It isn't even really very good down at 40 meters. This graph proves it absolutely conclusively that the size of the conductor is very, very, very important when you're building a magnetic loop. In fact, it's the number one important factor when you're building or buying a magnetic loop. And if you see a magnetic loop that has small conductors, don't buy it. 
or don't use that design to build one. It's the biggest mistake most magnetic loop builders and buyers ever make. So here's a takeaway for you. Here's something to embed in your thinking for good if you're ever going to buy or build a magnetic loop. Here's an optimized magnetic loop, a four foot square magnetic loop. This magnetic loop is good down to 40 meters, but no lower. It's a four foot square magnetic loop. Look at the ratio between the size of the loop and the diameter of the conductor. And notice the relative loop to conductor diameter ratio. If you want a loop that's going to work down to about 40 meters, it, the size of the conductor to the ratio of the size of the loop should be no smaller than 1 to 24. If you make the wire smaller, it's not going to work down there. It just isn't going to do it. This happens to be a, a loop that I've been showing around here. It's made out of PVC pipe and aluminum foil. We'll get to that later on. But this is an optimized mag loop that will work down to 40 meters with a loss of 3 dB. It's a reasonable magnetic loop, what I call an optimized mag loop. We'll see more of it here later. The only relatively efficient magnetic loop that I've ever seen on the market that'll work down to 40 meters is this one. It's the Ciro Mazzioni MIDI magnetic loop antenna. Any other magnetic loop I've ever seen on the market will not efficiently go down to 40 meters. I don't care how wonderful the ads are on the, on the internet and in the magazines, they are not efficient down to 40 meters. And how big is this one? Six and a half foot in diameter and it has three inch diameter conductors. This one will make 40 meters efficiently. Nothing of less than this kind of dimension is going to make 40 meters efficiently. Factor number two, now I'm gonna step on some toes here. I like this particular factor the best of all because it's gonna save you a lot of money, whether it be dollars, pounds, yens, or euros, or whatever. But we're going to save a lot of money with this factor. What is the best material to build a magnetic loop out of? OK, let's understand this. Here's a piece of wire on the left. I'm showing aluminum wire, but it could be copper wire just as well. Where does the current flow in a wire if it's AC or RF? because we're dealing with RF with a magnetic loop. If you know anything about skin effect, you know that RF or alternating current doesn't run in the inside of a conductor. Because of skin effect, which is caused by the magnetic field inside of the wire, the magnetic field pushes all the current to the outside of a conductor or to the edges of a conductor. All of the current flowing in a wire due to skin effect causes the current to flow only on the edges or the outside of a round wire, as you see here symbolized in red here. There's no current on the inside of that wire, or very little at least. There's no current on the inside of that piece of wire. So the center of the conductor of your antennas isn't needed. It could be a pure vacuum, and your antenna would work just as well. Let's look at the depth of the skin effect on your antennas. We need three skin depths. All of the current is running in three skin depths on your antennas. Let's look at what three skin depths is on your antennas. It's rated in mils, thousandths of an inch. A mil is a thousandth of an inch. On 80 meters, the depth of the, all of the current, all of these, the current in your antenna is all confined to five thousandths of an inch in aluminum, or copper in four thousandths of an inch. Look at 440 megahertz at the bottom. All of the significant current running in all of your antennas, in your magnetic loop or whatever it is, is confined in six ten thousandths of an inch. There's nothing running inside of the conduct of your magnetic loop. Therefore, 
aluminum foil on top of PVC pipe is just as good a material to build a magnetic loop out of as solid copper pipe. Why waste your money building a magnetic loop out of copper pipe? It's a waste of time, weight, money, and effort. I never build magnetic loops out of copper pipe. Waste of time. But when you go to buy the tape to build these, buy tape at least is sufficiently thick. Buy thick enough tape. Here's the optimized material to build magnetic loops out of. It's not copper pipe. Don't go down to your hardware store and buy a bunch of expensive copper pipe. Buy PVC pipe and put aluminum foil tape on top of it. That's what builds good magnetic loops. And you can build square corners, angle cut it and uh, glue it together. Makes great magnetic loops. And it works just as well as copper pipe. These are the optimized materials for building magnetic loops or other kinds of antennas for that matter. I built all sorts of of antennas out of plastic PVC pipe and aluminum foil tape. And here's the optimum material to build plastic antennas out of, aluminum air conditioning duct tape. You can get it on the internet or at your local hardware store very readily. You might say, well, isn't copper better than aluminum? Yes, it is, uh, conductive to, conductively, but the skin effect in, in aluminum is twice the thickness. So aluminum is just as good as copper for building out of. So I use aluminum foil tape and plastic pipe, and it builds an, it builds plastic antennas just as well as it builds as it builds as, as copper tape does. So I don't bother with copper tape. I use aluminum foil tape and PVC pipe and build all sorts of antennas with it. So here's the optimized material to build magnetic loops out of. Don't go down and buy copper pipe at $128 for a 10 foot length of inch and a half copper pipe. Go down and buy inch and a half PVC pipe at $17 for a 10 foot length. You'll save all sorts of money. That's how to optimize building a magnetic loop, not copper pipe, plastic pipe and aluminum foil tape. Factor number three, what shape do you want to build a, a, a magnetic loop. It has more to do with your neighbors and your HOA than it does to do with what you think the optimum shape is. Well, where does the shape of a magnetic loop come from in ham thinking? Well, it goes back to 1968. I remember this article. In fact, I have a copy of this QST from 1968. In fact, you can get one if you go to the QST archive. Lou McCoy saw an article that was uh, that was written by uh, Kenneth Patterson uh, for the uh, when he was working for the Army uh, Limited uh, War Laboratory in Maryland. He developed this antenna for use in Vietnam when they were using HF in Vietnam, and he built the what was called the the Army Loop. This Army Loop was uh, published back there in 1968 in QST. It was the where the Mag Loop got into ham thinking. Ken Patterson's army loop was octagonal in shape, put together this 12 foot diameter octagonal loop made with sections of aluminum tubing that he flattened the ends and bolted it together for conductivity and published this article. And Lou McCoy saw it and published this article in 1968. And this is where the magnetic loop got into the thinking of hams. And that's where the shape got into ham thinking. And that shape of octagonal stuck into the mind of hams. And from that day onward, hams have always thought that mag loops should be made round or octagonal. But that's not true. That's not the optimized shape for a magnetic loop. It works fine. An octagonal loop works fine for a magnetic loop. So does, so does round work fine for a magnetic loop. But so does square. Why do I say that? It's for this reason. Michael Faraday, way back in the 19th century, famous radio pioneer who helped uh, develop the famous uh, Maxwell equations, he discovered that magnetic loops don't care what their shape is. 
All that matters in terms of a magnetic loop is the area in the loop, not the shape. They can be round, they can be square, they can be octagonal, they can be triangular, they can be hexagonal, they can be whatever shape you want them. All that matters to a magnetic loop is its area. As long as you have the same area, they all work exactly the same. So what I did here is I made a little drawing, three different shapes, a square, a circle, and an octagon, all of the same area. And then I, I compared them to each other. So those three shapes on the, on the right over there are all exactly the same area. The dotted one is the circle, the octagonal one is the blue one, and the square is the, is the black one. They're all exactly the same area. I drew them in a, in a drafting program, so I get, was guaranteed that they're the same. How different are they in terms of a physical shape? Very little, very, very little. But now I ask you, which one of those shapes is the easiest shape to build? Clearly, it's a square. If you're going to go to the hardware store and buy some copper, which you don't have to, as I've shown you, you can build it out of plastic and aluminum foil tape. But if you're, if you're going to build it out of copper, which one is the easiest? Are you going to bend two-inch copper pipe into a circle or an octagon? Or let's suppose you're going to go and buy a bunch of elbows and try to make yourself an octagon. You're going to spend a fortune out of doing that. Even if you're going to build a square, it's going to cost you a lot of money for elbows. Even the square is difficult to build. But if you build it out of plastic, it's much cheaper, much easier. A square is the easiest shape. And as far as Michael Faraday proved way back in 1850, it works just as well as round or, or octagonal. Don't waste your time building magnetic loops round. I've seen some hideous articles on the internet of people building all sorts of awful jigs, trying to bend heavy copper pipe into circles. What an awful thing to try to do. Build them square. That's the optimized shape for a magnetic loop. As far as the shape of a magnetic loop, probably even more important are your neighbors. Now, here's your friendly neighbor looking over your back fence, thinking, what in the heck is that funny looking thing in my neighbor's backyard? Or maybe you've got your friendly homeowners association if you, if you live with a homeowners association like I do. I've got the nosy neighbor who comes walking down the street, looking over back fences, looking at things in the backyard, wondering what those funny looking things in the backyard are. What shape are they going to look into the backyard and see and say, what's that funny looking thing in the backyard? What shape are they going to notice? Are they going to notice round? Yeah, they probably are going to notice round. What shape are is going to be the least noticeable? Well, obviously, a square is going to be least noticeable. Even an octagon, if they see an octagonal shape in the background, they're going to notice that. But if they see a square, what are they going to think it is? Probably going to think it's a rose trellis. So it's pretty obvious. This may be the most important reason for making it square. So therefore, you want to make whatever you put in the background look like a decoration. Round is probably not a bad thing, certainly better than an octagon. That's why this particular decoration might be better. An old trampoline frame would be better than making it octagonal, at least. I thought this one was rather cute. This was a cute loop made in the shape of a heart. <laughs> and it, it was the nice thing about this one. It had a, a, a good tuning capacitor. Factor number four. Here's a factor most home loop builders don't, don't ever even know about, self-resonance. What's self-resonance? If you're going to be a loop builder, you need to know what self-resonance is because it's important. Uh, if you buy a loop, it's already been taken into account. But if you are going to build one yourself, 
you need to know what self-resonance is because self-resonance sets the maximum frequency of your loop. Let's go into that so in case you're going to be a loop builder. Here's just a simple a magnetic loop before you put the capacitor onto it. It's just a half wavelength loop of wire or tubing or whatever you're, whatever you're going to make it out of, whether it's plastic with foil on it or whether it's copper pipe or aluminum pipe or whatever it is. It's just a half wavelength loop of wire with a, uh, with a gap in it. But if any of you know a little bit of physics, recognize that any piece of wire has self-capacitance and self-inductance. It's natural to any piece of wire. In fact, anybody who e has ever made a coil, it's a simple coil of wire, one turn coil of wire with a gap in it, knows that it has natural inductance and natural capacitance uh, and that it has self-resonance. Any simple coil is automatically self-resonant. In fact, if you have a, a magnetic loop already, take the capacitor off of it and dip it with your antenna analyzer, and you will find it already has a resonant frequency. That's its self-resonant frequency. When you put the capacitor back onto it, you will lower the frequency, but it, with, even without the capacitor, it has self-resonance. That self-resonance is important in magnetic loops because it determines the maximum frequency that loop can ever tune. You can't tune a magnetic loop higher than its self-resonant frequency. And that determines how big you can make a magnetic loop. Uh, the, magnetic, the size of the magnetic loop, its self-resonant frequency determines the maximum frequency that loop can ever tune to. You can't do anything to that magnetic loop to make it tune to a higher frequency by adding anything to it. The only thing you can do to a magnetic loop to make it tune to a, to a higher frequency is to make it smaller. So here's a chart that I've developed for you that you can use to, uh, to determine how big a loop you can make and still make it tune. This is the self-resonant frequency chart of any magnetic loop. As you can see, there's the various sizes of a magnetic loop, the square loop, and you can see that the self-resonant frequency in terms of megahertz on the left, in terms of the size of the loop, it's an important little chart to have. As you can see, a four foot square loop is self-resonant at 31 megahertz. This is why I say a four foot square loop is probably an optimized size loop for making a nice little magnetic loop that'll tune most bands, most ham bands. If you make it bigger than that, it won't tune lower. Uh, you can't get it to tune higher than that. A magnetic loop can't be made to tune higher than, than its self-resonant frequency. Here is various self-resonant frequencies for various loop sizes. Here was, here's a little design tip for you if you're ever going to build a magnetic loop, a six meter loop that a good friend of mine, Bob Janke, K0XL built. Uh, with a, with a good conductor size, so it would work on six meters efficiently. And he used the ends of the loop as the tuning capacitor. It shows a, a two foot loop with the ends used as a uh, tuning capacitor, and it has self-resonant at uh, 63 megahertz. So if you're gonna make a mono band tuning capacitor, make the size of it just, uh, the, uh, just big enough so that it's self-resonant frequency is the highest frequency you want to operate on. For example, the Ciro Mazzioni MIDI magnetic loop can't work 10 meters. It just won't work 10 meters. You can't get it to go above 10 meters. So you, if you're going to buy one of these loops, it won't work. In fact, it won't work above 12 meters. It's just too big. So if you want if you want to buy one of these loops, which some people have thought about buying, uh, and they're they're very a very efficient loop down at lower frequencies, don't try to use it at uh, twelve meters and so forth. It works only only fifteen meters and down. So no single meg loop will work all HF bands. That's a point takeaway you need from this particular presentation. If you're going to work all HF bands. 
you're going to need to build more than one magnetic loop. So let me give you an optimized example. Here's one that I built. This is an optimized magnetic loop, which will work 10 through 20 meters, and it'll work okay on 40 meters. It's a four foot square loop made with inch and a half PVC pipe with aluminum foil on the outside. And there's aluminum foil on the inside of the corners. The corners are made with, uh, with, with uh, standard PVC elbows, which I've cut in half vertically. You can't see the cut in the corners, but it's cut, they're cut on a bandsaw. And so that the elbows and that T junction up at the upper left, is, they're cut in half on a bandsaw. And then the elbows are lined on the inside with the foil. And then they're held together with sheet metal screws, as you can see, to make connection around the corners. And that makes very efficient connection around the corners. It's a little difficult to get the aluminum foil inside of the elbows, but you can do it with a little patient. It's that self-adhesive aluminum tape. You can get it inside the, inside the elbows pretty easily with a little foot ever. It's a four foot square loop, four foot center line to center line here. So if you wonder about the size of that loop, it's just a, actually the pipes are 42 inches uh, and the, uh, Overall size of the loop is 40, 45 inches center to center. So it's easy to, easy to figure out how to make one of these loops. You just cut yourself four 45 inch pieces of uh, inch and a half PVC and uh, cut the uh, PVC fittings uh, in half uh, longitudinally on a bandsaw or with a hacksaw if you're, if you're patient. And that's a T junction there at the top. The reason, the reason it's a T junction is because there's a sliding capacitor that goes inside. There's a one inch PVC pipe that slides inside of the pipe. You'll see it here in a minute with a piece of aluminum foil on it that acts as a sliding capacitor that's inside of the pipe that slides over a gap inside. You can see the gap at the top up there. And then the, on the outside, there's another sliding capacitor which has a piece of aluminum foil on the outside which acts as a band, a band set capacitor. Now there's no vacuum variable, no rotary capacitor. This is a very simple, cheap tuning capacitor. I'll show it to you here in a minute. On the bottom is the matching network. We'll see it here in a minute. Here's the drawing. Now you can get the slides for this presentation just by going to w6nbc.com slash slides. You can download these slides for which you can easily, probably easily make one of these loops for, for yourself. By the way, those little aluminum sections there for the coupling loop there are 14 inches long. Now here's a little demonstration on how to apply this foil. It's a little tricky. By the way, this is four inch wide foil, four mil thick foil. That's thick enough to give you three foil depths for enough for depth depth to give you uh, enough conductivity on the pipe. And that's inch and a half PVC pipe to make the thing. The way I did this is I take on a piece of carpet, I take the four inch tape, I make it a little bit too long. I take a little bit of the foil off the end so I can make, I can fold over the end and make it sticky. And I stick the end down on the, uh, uh, on the pipe. And I pull the backing off and stick it onto the carpet just the ends are stuck to the carpet. Then I pull the backing off so that the sticky side is pointing upward at me. And then I push the pipe down onto the sticky surface. And then I snip the ends off so that I've now got the, the sticky side up and the foil and the paper backing is still on the back. And then you roll the, you roll the pipe back and forth and you can roll it on very smoothly. It takes two layers or two overlapping layers of this, uh, of this aluminum tape, four inch wide aluminum tape overlapped by one inch and it rolls very nicely onto the PVC pipe. And then you smooth it on with a, a, a plastic pen barrel and it smooths on very nicely onto the PVC pipe. You overlap it by one inch. The overlap gives you enough coupling by capacitive effect so that the uh, RF uh, doesn't see the adhesive on the tape. Here are the elbows. As you can see, it takes a little patience. You have to cut a little right angle piece and, and smooth it inside of the pipe. 
you can see the smooth overlaps where the ends of the pipe make contact with the, uh, the smoothed in section there on the ends. And you can see the holes where the sheet metal screws come through and squeeze the, the cut off uh, elbows there, but that makes good contact. You can also paint the inside of those elbows if you want to with the shielding paint, which you can get from M&G Chemicals. They make shielding paint, uh, which you can paint on the inside or spray on the inside. Although, although this stuff is uh, relatively expensive, the shielding paint is uh, very conductive. You can buy it in copper, silver, or nickel. And nickel, it has nice metal particles inside of it. I have never tried it yet, but I, I know it works well because I've checked its conductivity. It's very effective uh, spray on paint for making boxes and other things conductive. And you can get it in spray versions or you can get it in uh, paint on versions, but it does, it is fairly expensive. A, a can of that or a, or a bottle of it is about $15. You can also get conductive fabrics. Conductive fabrics also make, uh, make good material to put inside of those elbows if you want to. I've uh, tried that and it works very well. That conductive fabric, by the way, uh, is good material and it's very conductive. Put an ohmmeter across it and it's, it's just like a piece of wire. And it's relatively inexpensive, as you can see. I'm gonna show you something here in a minute you can use it for. I have an interesting little project, which I think you'll be amused by. For example, here's a mountain topper. Some of you might be HF mountain toppers where you like to pack your radio to a mountaintop, soda, you know, uh, go out to do uh, park outings, like to take your radio out into the parks. What do you do for an antenna when you do that? Well, throwing a, a small whip or a wire over a bush when you're up on a mountaintop isn't a very good antenna. Well, this guy, this guy's got one. He's hiking up to a mountain to do his mountain topping. Well, I've got a suggestion for you. Here's my, I know this is a little way out, but I think I thought this was rather interesting. Eh, maybe you'd like to try this one. This is quite fine. Maybe this the conductive fabric might, might tickle your fancy. Here's my idea for an inflatable blow up loop portable uh, mag loop antenna. I know this is a little wild, but, uh, but bear with me. I think you might enjoy this one. This is a portable, blow up magnetic loop antenna. There you can see it, here's all finished, sitting on its little portable stand. This one can be taken down, folded up, put inside of a backpack and with this little portable stand and carried up to a mountaintop. This is a killer antenna for a mountaintop rather than some little wimpy wire thrown over a tree. Here's matching. Here's how to match a mag magnetic loop. By the way, I have a whole presentation on that mountaintop mag loop if you'd like to see it. And you can download the slides for it if you want from my website. Here's how you match the mag loop. The mag loop can be matched in a number of ways. The, the common ways of matching it are with a separate loop. I know some of you know this already. There's a separate loop, which is a transformer. This is one of my favorite ways. Or you can use a tap match, which is, to, is a modified gamma match, which was what was also used uh, back in the days of tube type radios inside of a, of a coil can. Inside of one of those cans, you had coils which were tap matched. And that's what we use here for tapping a magnetic loop. You, you just, because a magnetic loop is, is resonant. And because it's a resonant loop, the impedances around the loop are, pure, are purely resistive. So somewhere around the loop, from high impedance at the top to low impedance at the bottom, you'll find a 50 ohm point. All you've got to do is make yourself a movable tap point, like a coil inside of a, inside of a little can inside of the radio. And all you got to do is move that tap point and you'll find 50 ohms. And that's how this, this particular match works. You just move it by, and I made three little half inch aluminum, aluminum pipes, 14 inches long, and bolts to hold them together with wing nuts on them uh, to uh, 
So I could make the move that and you move that little match arm, which was a, with a U bolt, and you can find the 50 ohm point very, very easily by moving that little arm. I find that the I find that that arm easily finds the match point by by moving it. Tuning, you can tune this loop if you want with a vacuum variable. Some of my viewers have done that, uh, but there's no need to do it. You don't need to use a vacuum variable to tune this loop. Can if you want, but vacuum variables are expensive. They're hard to obtain these days what, with what's going on over there with the, the Soviet Union, because most vacuum variables these days are coming from that part of the world. Rotary variables are usable, of course, and uh, probably uh, some of my viewers have used them, but they, they have their losses. The wipers in them don't work very well, and they're pretty expensive and hard to get. But here's one of my readers who uh, use one. That's a rotary capacitor. And there's one of my loops right there. Here's an inexpensive way to make a, a variable capacitor for this loop. This is my early method. You can use this method if you like. It works very well. There's one of the elbows on my four foot loop. I just drilled a hole in the end and there's a cord sticking out of the end. As you notice, what is the cord connected to? Here's what the cord is connected to. It's just a piece of PVC pipe shoved inside of the upper pipe of the square loop. And the square loop works for this. A round loop won't work for this. You have to use a square loop. Piece of one inch PVC pipe shoved into the upper pipe. And on that piece of one inch PVC pipe is covered with aluminum foil, same aluminum foil. When that piece of one inch pipe is centered on the, on the gap, the two little capacitors that are formed by that little capacitor inside are equal and the capacity is maximum across the loop. Pull it off center with the cord and one of them gets smaller and one of them gets bigger. But when two capacitors in series, one of them gets smaller, the smaller dominates and the total capacity gets smaller. When it's on center, the total capacity is maximum. So all you got to do is attach a cord on that little sliding capacitor inside, and you can adjust the capacity. Cheap, no tuning, no vacuum variable, no big rotary capacitor. And with a pull cord, you can adjust this magnetic loop. Uh, it's a very simple way to do it uh, and very cheap. And you can band tune it the same way. You can put one on the outside take a bigger piece of PVC pipe, piece of two inch PVC pipe, and cut it in half longitudinally and put a piece of aluminum foil tape on the, on the outside of it and just set it over the top of the gap. And then make, a whole, make several of them, make one for each band, make one for 20 meters, make one for 15 meters, make one for 10 meters and put it on top. And then that sets the band and then use the little pull cord to do the fine tuning with. So you use a, du a dual tuning capacitor. It makes a very easy way to manually tune it. Of course, you got to step out in the backyard and, and do this manually, but that's not too difficult to do that. I don't mind stepping out in the ba backyard to do a little band tuning. That's not difficult. You can automate it if you want to. In fact, I'm going to show you a way one of my readers automated this. But simple band tuning, you can automate this loop. You can use a T and, and do it too. Here's my method. Uh, here's the little pipe that's going, you can use a, instead of a pull cord, you can use a pipe coming in from the outside and you can see the uh, aluminum foil on the inside, a piece of one inch PVC, and you can push the pipe back and forth instead of using a pull cord. And there's the band set capacitor. There's the 20 meter version on the outside. And you can see the length, it's a, that's a, about 14 inches long on the outside and about 12 inches long on the inside. And that's an easy method to make that loop tunable with that little four foot square loop. There's the uh, pull method uh, using the uh, T section instead of uh, a pull cord. Here's one of my viewers decided to motorize it. Instead of using my, my pull pipe method, he motorized the pull cord method. He uh, put a uh, little box down at the bottom with a uh, 
stepper motor in it and put a pull cord down from the little uh, pull pipe at the top and just pulled the uh, pipe with a pull cord and a stepper motor from the bottom and was able to fine tune the loop very easily with a stepper motor from the bottom. So there's lots of way you can motorize there. You can also see he used the uh, matching method that I showed you there as well, used copper pipe with the uh, squashed ends. So there's lots of ways you can motorize this loop and, and automate it if you want to. This is a great experimental loop, but it works very, very well. Pretty cheap to build, pretty easy to build. Now, I learned another thing about this loop, though, which I want to pass on to you. If you build this loop, it's better to build the top of the loop out of, not out of PVC. I learned a kind of a bitter lesson that PVC is kind of lossy. It's much better to use a better plastic to build the top pipe with. It's better to build it out of, out of polyethylene pipe instead of PVC pipe. PVC is kind of lossy. And, you'll, you'll in, in, and so PEX pipe, which is polyethylene extensible, is better pipe. So rather than polyvinyl chloride pipe, which is, it's better to replace the top pipe with a, a piece of uh, one inch PEX pipe instead. This is a later development, but it works perfectly well. Use PEX pipe for the top instead of PVC. This whole loop is still in development, and I, I beg your pardon that it's that way, but I think you can see what to do with it here if you're a builder. Also, low-density polyethylene bottles are good for, for being for use for the outside capacitor if you want to want to use uh, a builder material rather than uh, PVC. Factor number seven, let's talk a little bit about receive loops. If you're going to build a magnetic loop for receive only, I recommend that you don't match it. In other words, don't try to make it a 50 ohm loop. Just make the loop and don't match it. The IEEE realized that a magnetic loop is better unmatched. You'll get better bandwidth and better gain if you don't match it. It's better signal to noise. I haven't done a lot of research on this one yet, but if you're going into using a magnetic loop as a receive only antenna, I highly recommend you don't, you don't match the loop. You just put it directly into a high impedance receiver. That's just a point of design in case any of you are interested in thinking about using a magnetic loop as a receive only antenna. And there's, there's some good benefits to using uh, receive only antennas. This is another totally other subject, but I thought I'd put it into this presentation in case some of you are thinking about using them as receive only antennas. There's some good benefits to using receive only antennas and not using your transmit antenna as your receiving antenna. That's another totally different subject. So take it as an aside here in this presentation. Some takeaways though on magnetic loops. Do do this. I haven't done the build it material on this either. This is just a good idea for those of you who are experimenters, want to experiment, and you do do some experimenting on this, and you and you have some feedback here. Please share it with me. Multiple turn magnetic loops are a good idea because for this reason, if any of you look at the equations for the design of magnetic loops, and I have looked at them and they're readily available on the internet. If you look at the equations for magnetic loops, the formulas for the efficiency of a magnetic loop show you this. The efficiency of, the mag of a magnetic loop goes up as the square of the, of the number of turns. So if you double the number of turns in a magnetic loop, like this magnetic loop you see here, the efficiency of it, in other words, the amount of power you lose from your transmitter in the, in the conductor loss, that number one factor I pointed out to you, the amount of power you lose in the conductor loss compared to the radiation loss, the efficiency goes up in a magnetic loop as the square of the number of turns. So increasing the number of turns in a magnetic loop is a definite advantage. 
So if you do if you do any design of magnetic loops, if you're into designing, think about a multi-turn magnetic loop. Uh, if you're not into design, make them in the normal way. But that's a bit for those of you who may be into design. But now here's a bad idea. Don't buy into this design. Don't make magnetic loops out of flat straps, a flat conductor. Don't you, you know, see several designs on the internet that show you building magnetic loops out of flat strips. Don't do that. That's a bad idea. Why? Because skin effect causes all of the current in a flat strap to rush to the edge. All that does is waste most of the flat conductor, waste and, and increases the conductor loss. This is a very bad idea. This is a very low efficiency magnetic loop. Make your magnetic loop conductors round. Don't make them flat straps. That's a poor design idea. Here's another very bad idea. I know some, some people have thought, oh, I've got a great idea. Uh, this is a bad idea from two reasons. It's made out of flat strap. That's a bad idea. And number two, it's made convoluted. That's a bad idea too. In other words, they, they thought, oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll fold it back and forth like that. That's even worse. That's a very bad idea. This is a bad loop for two reasons. No, that doesn't gain you. That loses you. This is a terrible magnetic loop. And here's a third one. Some people have thought, well, I can make my loop smaller by making it helical. I'll take some nice copper, some nice good copper tape. And I'll instead of making it a, a single round conductor, I'll wrap it helically with copper tape. And this will make it a much bigger loop in a smaller size. No, it won't. It'll make it a terrible loop. This is an awful loop. This is reducing the efficiency, something terribly. Don't do this. You'll see this on the internet recommended several places, but don't do it. It's awful. And this is another bad idea. If you're going to build a magnetic loop, only use it vertically. It's only good as a vertical antenna. Don't try to use it as a horizontal antenna. It's a vertical only. Here's another closing thought. Some of you are going to balk at this one, but it's true. You will have heard it said that magnetic loops only respond to the magnetic component of the electromagnetic wave. That is not true. That's a falsehood. Magnetic loops respond to the electric and the magnetic component exactly as any other antenna does. Yes, Michael Faraday did prove that in the near field of, the, of a magnetic loop, that most of the effect is happening in the magnetic field. He also proved that in the near field of a, of a small dipole, that most of the effect is happening in the electric field. But as soon as the wave gets any distance away from either a, a dipole or from a loop antenna, that the wave is absolutely identical. And the incoming wave to either a loop antenna or a dipole antenna, it all goes back to the same thing. It all gets converted, converted back to the same thing. So an incoming wave, which is an electromagnetic wave, all produces the same effect when it gets back into a magnetic loop or back into a dipole. So a magnetic loop does not respond to only to the magnetic component of the electromagnetic wave. And a dipole does not respond only to the electric component of, a, of the magnetic wave. It responds to both of them, just as a, the magnetic loop responds to both components of the electromagnetic wave and generates both components of the electromagnetic wave. Both types of antennas, a dipole or a loop, both produce and respond to both components of the electromagnetic wave. There is no difference in the electromagnetic wave. 
that both both produce and both respond to between a, a magnetic loop, so-called magnetic loop, and so-called electromagnetic dipole. They're both the same. So technically speaking, there is no such thing as a magnetic loop. It's a misnomer. It's a name that shouldn't be propagated. I don't like the term magnetic loop. I use it because it's a common name, but it's a total misnomer. Therefore, I, I know people are going to jump all over me with all four feet, but it's a name that shouldn't be used as far as I'm concerned. A lot of people labor under the misconception that because it's a magnetic loop, it won't hear magnetic interference nearby. That's not true. That's a lie. Don't believe it. Okay, I added that because I think it's important for you to break the myth of the magnetic loop. There isn't a magnetic loop. It's a small transmitting loop. Both small dipoles and magnetic loops are sensitive to both electric and magnetic fields. Here's one thing that is good, though, to take with you as a closing thought. There is very little benefit to elevating a so-called magnetic loop. You may as well use it close to the ground because it works nearly well ground-mounted. So uh, don't bother yourself to put it up on a high tower. It doesn't work better on a high tower. You may as well put it near the ground, but mount it vertically. Don't mount it horizontally. Okay, there you are. That's, that's the magnetic loop. It's an interesting antenna. It's a good antenna. I highly recommend them, and I use them with great pleasure.